conditions for more discussion. Those are the conditions for more debate. So in the absence of a consensus, it's not to say that we're going to be frozen in our tracks. It's not to say that I'm not going to make a decision to move ahead. We compromise all the time. But that underscores the value and importance of continuing to debate it. And this leads to the final thing I want to make, and then we'll throw it open for whatever discussion and comments you might have. Why have this process at all if we're not going to arrive at a consensus in the near term? There's a, a, an interesting guy at MIT named Donald Schoen who has studied practitioners and, and argues that there is a process called what he calls thinking in action. And, it, and it's a way of taking these claims, rehabilitating them, rehabilitating them. In other words, beginning with common sense, which is where we get our practical knowledge, which is where we get our ethical knowledge, and rehabilitating that because common sense is fundamentally flawed, it's inconsistent, it's contradictory, and so on and so on. So we're going to improve it, we're going to make it more rigorous through this process of discourse, through this practical discourse, as Habermas describes it, this process focused on the quality of the argument as opposed to the credentials of the speaker. And that Schoen argues that this process itself makes practitioners, and there's pretty good empirical evidence in support of this, makes practitioners more reflective. It stops them and has them think about the consequences of their conduct, think about how it might affect others, and that the process itself might improve performance, even though we're not going to reach a consensus for another 15 years. So that, you know, that this process of responding to your critics, this process of being eloquent, thinking publicly, thinking out loud in terms of the justifications for what you did and the application of what you did. There's two parts to discourse ethics. One is the justification of the norm, the justification of the principle, and then the other is the justification of the application of the principle. And both parts needs to be, um, we need to pay attention to, to both parts in, in this discourse ethics. So my argument basically is, is that the best and most useful and certainly the most democratic way of understanding ethics, particularly ethics in journalism, right, is to equate it with accountability, to, to suggest to journalists that if you want to be able to say, I acted ethically, I acted ethically doesn't mean conforming to a particular code. It doesn't mean doing something that others had done before. Um, it doesn't mean abiding by whatever ethical or moral experts you're citing, whether it's the church or a professional group or anything else. To say I acted ethically means I am committed to this process of public scrutiny. I am committed to the proposition that I will justify as best I can, and Habermas has an elaborate set of criteria for what constitutes a practical discourse and who has access to it. He has a large discussion of communicative competence. What does it mean to, to talk in a way that will honor reciprocity and mutuality and and discover a consensus that, not, that might not have never occur to us individually. But that this process, that committing to that process, is what it means to say, I acted ethically. And by that standard, there's very little in the way of ethics in journalism. You can make the same thing about other professions, but I'm particularly interested in, in journalism because journalism is so interested in questions of accountability. That's what defines journalism, what journalists call accountability journalism, that notion of a watchdog press, the fourth estate, an adversarial press. So there's a focus on accountability journalism, but there's virtually no attention to journalism accountability. So let me stop there and see what questions or comments or suggestions you might have. For, for a journalist to be um, to be open to that uh, public scrutiny, what what implies? You know, like what what can make the difference in the daily life of a journalist? You know, like if you say that you're committed, uh, that you're ethical, and for you it means that you're aware that you are um, that you are um, that you could be submitted to this public scrutiny. But in the day. In the day news yeah. coverage, what that implies? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And, and the seminar this quarter is talking about just that. And clearly, we don't want to impose on journalists this burdensome um, scheme where they're responding to anyone and everyone with all sorts of complaints. There needs to be someone making threshold judgments. 
about what kind of question is worthy of, of a response. We need a manager of deliberation, as it's, as it's been called. Somebody who's going to make judgments about um, what issues meet this threshold, what issues require or deserve a response from the press. And the press needs to make an institutional commitment to this. The editors, the managers, the publishers need to be able to say to reporters, we're going to give you the time right, to respond to these questions, as opposed to saying, you know, do it on top of everything else. You've got a story due at 5 o'clock. You also have to set aside two hours to respond to this complaint. And then the related question is, um, what happens if you get, you know, 300 people making essentially the same complaint? You know, somebody needs to decide. Um, it's not, you know, Habermas's discourse ethics isn't about giving everyone a chance to participate in the, in the debate. It's a matter of making sure that everything worth saying gets said. And that, there's a big difference. There's, there's no need for someone to say essentially what was said 10 minutes ago. And there's no need to, to repeat it over and over and over again. So we need to develop a system of representation so that all important ideas, all important arguments get entered into this forum um, w without being beaten up numerically. In other words, without having to hear the same argument 300 times. Um, it, what's much more important is hearing the two novel arguments expressed clearly, articulate, articulately, and, and in the most compelling way. So it's going to require an institutional commitment on journalism to take the process seriously and then a way to make it work so that journalists aren't being distracted by trivial questions. Okay. I have uh, two very different questions. <clears throat> One has to do with, uh, with this absence of criticism within the press about the press. Um, uh, I don't know if this is a universal rule, but by and large, newspapers avoid criticizing other newspapers. Yes. They're all in the same business, so that is already a problem. Uh, and I think it is a problem from the viewpoint also of uh, common sense practicality because that coupled with your initial statement about uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that one has to separate knowledge from interest, there's no knowledge that is, um, that is totally uh, neutral or uh, not associated with particular interests, then we begin talking about the existence of separate communities even within right. journalism. Right. And so common sense then uh, kind of explodes and you have shards of common sense. Um, the absence of, of uh, criticism, the abs absence of, uh, by and large, a public platform that uh, consistently looks upon journalism and then comments on it, um, I wonder if you think that it's being not exactly um, remedied, but to a certain extent limited by the appearance of the digital press and the availability of, uh, uh, for readers, uh, the, uh, the option of commenting or not commenting. Uh, I'd like to know what you think about that, as well as the fact that for many newspapers, this option for readers also allows them to do so from anonymity. Yes. Um, which is a problem from the point of view of an open public uh, forum for, for public opinion and democracy. And then the second question, which is totally uh, different, as I said, has to do with, um, with uh, the uh, connection between some of these issues of accountability and ethics with the uh, the coming together in certain instances of um, journalism that wants to be uh, objective and not but not not uh, submitted to uh, or subject to uh, to uh, particular positions and uh, literature which is not only so but is openly and avowedly so. Yeah, let me let me take the first one first. Um, I mean, you raise an important question about you know the internet and to what extent it solved problems or created problems. Um, a colleague and I are in the middle of doing a study of a feature at the New York Times called Talk to the Times. Uh, it's online only. It would take up too much room in the newspaper. So it's a good example of a digital space that would have never created, would have never existed pre-digital. And it's an opportunity to, for editors and key reporters to respond to questions from readers. Um, the problem with it is that they get to select the questions and they get to decide when the response is adequate. And so part of what we're studying are the rhetorical tropes, the, the rhetorical techniques that the Times uses to close down the discussion. And one of the, one, we've labeled these conversation stoppers, you know, how the Times will stop a conversation. One popular way for stopping a conversation is to say, we're the New York Times, I'm paraphrasing, 
we're the New York Times, we're the best there is, give us a break. You know, yes, we could have, we could have done it differently, but no one else is nearly as committed as we are. And that's pretty much the end of that discussion. There's, there's no follow-up to that. I mean, how could you follow-up to that? It's a mea culpa. You know, we, we messed that up, but no one's trying harder than we are. Um, and there's no response to the response. There's never a rejoinder. All right, so the reader is not called on again to say, was my response adequate? So although you do have online this potential for interactivity, we see none of it in a forum like that. No interactivity at all. So in, in our, for, for our, from our point of view, um, it's, it's a misused or underutilized space. It could have been an opportunity for accountability, but it's really not. It's more now simply a, a forum for public relations, explaining what the Times does, justifying what the Times does, in the absence of any discussion. There is no deliberation. There is no arguing. Because argument can't be in the form of a monologue. And these are strictly monologic. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think the digital realm has tremendous potential. There's software out, na out now. There's, there's many forms of software out now that allows for interactivity. Um, there's, I'm not aware of any software built specifically for purposes of making journalism more accountable, but I don't think that would be a difficult thing to achieve. The difficulty will be convincing newsrooms to use it, which is going to require a different mindset. It's going to require a, a different understanding of the central image of a free press. It's going to require the introduction of a new mythology. Um, and, and I think that's the bigger challenge. And I think it's a challenge, interestingly, that, that we faced here at, at the university. You know, I, I think it's not going to change until we're able to convince students going into journalism that they need to understand journalism differently, that they need to understand ethics differently, that they need to understand accountability differently. You know, I think we have failed as leaders. And we talk about the absence of local press criticism. And I, and I mean that not, a, not only as a criticism of journalism, but as a criticism of journalism educators. Journalism educators have done a miserable job of providing local press criticism. I mean, after all, we should be in a position where we're willing to do that. But journalism schools in the United States grew up as arms of the industry. We were so clear, closely connected to the industry when schools first began to emerge, in the, particularly in the Midwest in the early 1900s. We were, you know, journalism programs were sponsored by state press associations. We were, con we were considered feeders into the industry. In fact, we organized our schools around the deployment of personnel in newsroom. Newsrooms had an advertising department. We had a department of advertising. They had a department of it, news editorial, it was called. We did too. Just as the digital landscape is changing, our curriculum is changing. But it's not leading the industry so much as it is, as it is reflective of the industry. We desperately need the industry support for internships, for funding for our research. It's difficult on the one hand to say we want to prepare our students for a job in your newsroom and then criticize your newsroom at the same time. I, I can't begin to tell you how many editors I've offended and how many internships I've probably screwed up. Um, or lost uh, because of local battles with the press. So it, it's not an easy thing for journalism educators, to, not an easy role for journalism educators to play, but I think it's an absolutely essential role given the role that I think universities ought to be playing in society. Uh, and that is a fundamentally critical role. Not, not critical in a, in a partisan sense, critical in the sense that whatever the status quo is, the status quo needs to be publicly questioned constantly. In fact, constantly reinvigoration that I think the university needs to commit itself to, and I think journalism programs have by and large become too vocational over the years to do that, too tied to the industry to do that. I think you can make the same claim about other departments on campus too, but I'm mostly interested in you know, the failings of my own domain. And the other question had to do with literature and journalism. Yeah, you know, it's a missed opportunity. I, in, in some of my seminars I have students read Hayden White's account of history and, and ask them to compare Hayden White's claims about history to journalist claims about journalism. I mean, Hayden White in, in his many books argues, and this is a, a crude reduction of his argument, but basically that history is, histories are stories. Stories about the past and stories about the past with a moral point of view. That there's no way to tell a story about the past without making a bigger point about what's right and wrong and good and bad. And I think journalists do exactly that on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we could just get journalists to reflect on the moral dimensions, we tried to do this in, in that book I wrote on investigative journalism and public virtue, you know, arguing that investigative journalism, here's the paradox we tried to explore in that book. On the one hand, journalists 
um, claim to be, as investigative journalists, they claim to be exposing wrongdoing. And so we asked journalists, how do you go about exposing wrongdoing and at the same time claim to be morally disengaged? That was the paradox. And they have to claim to be morally disengaged right, in order to maintain their professional credentials. And so we, you know, we studied in this book the processes through which journalists convert moral claims into empirical claims. Of course, all that belongs in a news story are the empirical claims. So, and it's been a, and it's a topic that's been studied by many other people. But journalists will defend the empirical aspects of their story, not the moral aspects of the story. And so what they end up doing is embedding the moral claims in the empirical claims so they can sidestep accountability for the morality or the moral positions of their story. But any investigative story is all about morality. It's all about good and bad and right and wrong. And they are patrolling the moral order. And they're pointing us in the direction of people who have violated the moral order. And what strikes me there is, is how it resonates with hate and wise claims about history. That we understand the past in terms of what's good and bad, and what's right and wrong. We understand yesterday in terms of what's right and wrong, good and bad. And in that sense, I don't see much difference between what journalists do and what historians do. And if you regard good histories as good and interesting <coughs> literature, but invest, I'm just thinking local subject, Shira Conway. Okay, corrupt political official. Right. Okay. The, the investigative reporters are just following your common sense. Exactly. You know, this is offensive to everybody. Exactly. When we study these investigative reporters, we, we discovered four things that journalists will do to convert moral claims into parallel. Empirical claims. First, they'll use statistical norms. You know, they'll say what you did is wrong because everyone else did it differently. And it's not an independent argument about. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no, no objective claim. If about the whole it. tribe considers it's wrong, exactly. it's wrong. Exactly. Exactly. If everyone else is doing it this way and you're doing it that way, you're wrong. That's, that's one way of doing it. Second way is to invoke uh, moral experts. What you did is wrong because so and so said you did it wrong. Who's so and so? It could be a priest. Or it could be somebody who has technical knowledge. So one of the stories we looked at was um, police dogs in Philadelphia run amok. Police dogs that were biting too many people by accident. That could be a scandal, right? That nutty police dogs are biting innocent people. And is, is that a sign of bad behavior? Not on the part of the dogs, but on the part of the police department? Or not? Well, the guy who did this story, who later won a Pulitzer Prize for it, struggled and struggled and struggled to find a moral expert. Somebody who's willing to go on the record and say, that's wrong. You know, a, a canine unit will have, you know, three Aaron bites a year, not 300. And I needed somebody to make that claim. Finally found a retired transit officer from New York, a transit police officer, who was willing to go on the record and say, that's way too many accidental bites. There's a problem with the police department. Now, you may regard that person as a suspect moral expert, but it worked in a one of a Pulitzer Prize because of the way he weaved it into his story. All right, he, he, it was stories of outrage, stories of indignation, but he documented the transgression empirically by saying, here is a moral expert. Here's somebody who worked with a canine unit in New York City, for crying out loud. He knows good bites from bad bites, and he said this is a, a bad bite. The other is... is um, um, to find a code of conduct, not a law, but a code of conduct that somebody violated, and all you need to do is, and it's not, not a matter of illegality, and the, and the story we worked on here was the uh, University of Kentucky basketball team. Um, the Lexington Herald in Kentucky exposed wrongdoing at the University of Kentucky basketball team because they violated NCAA standards. And the NCAA standards became the moral universe, became the moral statement. Now, ironically, most people in Lexington, Kentucky, keep in mind Lexington, Kentucky has two sacred institutions, right, basketball and horses, and, and no one found the NCAA code compelling. So most of the local people found the violations trivial and inconsequential, did not see the NCAA standard as, as a, constituting a very interesting moral order, um, but the Pulitzer Committee did. And again, this guy won a Pulitzer Prize, but he was railroaded out of town. No one, no one would talk to him, you know, because he was picking on one of the sacred institutions. And the last um, example comes to, it speaks to exactly what you're talking about.
Um, we did a, a study of um, a Pulitzer Prize winning report at the Washington Post who wrote a story about jail rape in suburban Maryland. Um, men who are getting raped in jail, not even convicted of a crime, and in some cases in jail, they were just waiting to be charged. They were in jail and they got raped, and, or they were in jail for an absolutely trivial crime. You know, they, they didn't pay a parking ticket and they had to spend 90 days in jail. And, and as a consequence of that, they got raped and the system was just awful. And we asked this reporter what we asked every reporter. Well, so what was so wrong with that? And her response was just amazing. She looked at me and said, only an academic would ask a question. <laughs> any, anyone with any smarts, anyone with their eyes open, wouldn't even ask the question. It's obvious what's wrong with that. Obvious. This is that notion of common decency. Right? Anyone in the community, no one would pick up that story and wonder, why are they writing that story? What's so bad about Joe? Right? You explained to her you were asking as an academic. Exactly. And this is how you personally and, and felt. That, and that completely reinforced your views of academics. <laughs> but but it, it was at the level of common sense and common decency. You must lack common sense to even ask the question. And she was right. I mean, there was never a letter to the editor that said, what justified that story? Mm -hmm. It was just obvious. But there was no, no tie to empirical evidence as there was in other cases. She just assumed the empirical domain was there at the level of common sense. With the internet now, and we do have access to fact-checking organizations and websites, which to me, before the internet, that was impossible. Does that add some accountability on, for journalism or anything, really? It's like, wait a minute, where did he get that statistic? That doesn't sound right. At all. It does. I mean, that, that site that labels things pants on fire, liar, liar. Um, you know, it's very effective. And, and you're right, there's much of that out there now. There's a lot of it. Um, but it doesn't add up to an argument. It provides the facts, the empirical evidence that people need to use in their arguments. Um, but it's that, that next step that's missing. So there is more factual information out there. There are these fact checkers. So in that aspect of reporting is held to a higher standard of scrutiny, but there's still the that additional step of taking those facts and figures and weaving them into an argument about the morality of the journalist's conduct. You know, because there can be innocent mistakes. You know, I got it wrong because I didn't have enough time in the day. I got it wrong because the source misled me. There, there are many explanations and, and even justifications for getting things wrong. So it's the argument that matters. But I. I do agree that there's more, uh, there's more material on which to base the argument now than there ever has been before. Professor, how does the media that in countries that is facing, you know, like um, hostile environments to do their job, um, uh, deals with this challenge to be account accountable to? You know, because I think the media, especially in this hostile environment, it, it's afraid that some other powers um, take advantage of this self criticism that the journalists need to. Yeah, I and mean, that's a tough one. I've, I've come to believe over the years that democracy as a system of government and democracy as a way of life is very much a luxury. The people who can afford it are the people who live in security. In the absence of security, democracy is going to be one of the first things to go. You know, and, and, and under those circumstances, I'd be hard pressed to argue that you know the press under those conditions are going to be too preoccupied with questions of accountability. I mean, their their challenge is surviving until tomorrow. Their challenge is you know dodging the next bullet. You know, and under those circumstances, I don't want to I don't want to lecture them about accountability. You know, now. For the, you know, for the press that's more secure, you know, there are not only regional and local and national opportunities for accountability, but there are international opportunities for accountability. And American journalism, like American society in general, aren't very interested in those forms for accountability. The United Nations, UNESCO, every time there's a commission appointed to study the press, the American press responds in disbelief. Oh, how dare you even ask the question? To even ask the question is to violate their First Amendment autonomy. To even ask the question. 
And this is, you have the same thing. There was a, just that big commission in, in <coughs> Britain, the Leverson <coughs> Committee, that looked at the phone hacking scandal that involved Rupert Murdoch and others. You're not going to have anything like that in the United States. Every time a Senate subcommittee looks into the press, um, the press editorials are, sh are, are written at a level of shock. How could they even ask questions about it? And so long as we have that attitude that the press is the one institution that's off limits, it's hard to take accountability seriously. So I, I'm not calling for a Senate subcommittee investigation <laughs> of the press, um, but, but rather inviting the press to take accountability a little more seriously by welcoming criticism rather than rejecting it at, at, at its face. Um, so if the press finds an error in itself, would you suggest that like the article in question would be would be sort of uh, reprimanded or would the writer, the journalist, be the one who faces the yeah. punishment? Here's the ideal scenario, and it's very much the ideal. If there was a serious error in a story, not a trivial error, but a serious error or a uh, serious error in fact or a serious error in perspective, a serious error in context, whatever, whatever the charge might be, um, the ideal scenario would be for the editor to invite someone from the community to comment on it. It might be you or it might be somebody else. It might be an academic who um, might be willing to play that role. And then to have the people involved in the publication of the story respond. Now, it may be the reporter. It may be the reporter and the editor. It may be only the editor. I don't know. And, and this, is, this is why we need a manager of deliberation, somebody who's in a position to say, um, here's a legitimate argument from a reader about the quality of your performance. Um, I want the two of you to respond. Then it goes back to the reader. Are you satisfied with the response? If you are, that's the end of it. If you're not, we need more discussion. All right? As we move closer and closer to that ideal of consensus. How many iterations will we have? I don't know. Does it need to be done in a particular time frame? No, it doesn't need to be done by next Sunday but it needs to be done while it's still fresh. And it needs to be public, which is to say it needs to be published so other people can join in. Now you might say, that's, a, that's really a luxury and it's expensive. It was 10 years ago. It's not that expensive to do it online. And most of this can be done online so long as it's flagged in print. In other words, that little bar that says, you know, log on here for this discussion. And journalists have long argued that, oh, this is insider stuff. No one's going to be interested in this. And I think it's just the opposite. I think readers would find that kind of discussion fascinating. It's the inner workings of the press. I think the, from what I can tell, the public editor column at the New York Times is widely read. They like that kind of insight. They, they enjoy those kinds of arguments because we live with the press in a very public way. Right? Journalism does its business in a conspicuously public way. And I think discussions of how journalism works uh, would gain considerable public interest. So th that would be the ideal, but it would require a commitment on the press to play those roles. I, mean, I, I can't even convince the Stanford Daily, and I'm, I'm chairing their board of directors, I can't even convince them to, to hire a public editor. They did once, and it worked out really well, but their attitude is, oh, we're barely able to fill up the newspaper, you want us to you know, hire an additional position and manage somebody, and it's not that they're opposed to it, it's just the kind of thing they never get around to doing. And I think it's, it's true. It's inertia that kills this thing off. So when you talk to editors, they might not be diametrically opposed to the idea, but it's going to cost me $50,000 a year to hire a part-time person to do that. And that means I have to make a choice between an ombudsman and a sports editor. Um, and, and I can appreciate that, right? Uh, within investigative reporting, is there a form of, I'm a novice to this, is there a form of self-policing or a code of ethics that uh, exists that, that even if it's abstract within, uh, within the community. Um, and the, I wanted to follow up, that up. Is there, uh, there's obviously a power gradient between the reporter and its community. Is, is there a sense of power there that can limit the self policy? Yeah. The first part, there's a group called Investigative Reporters and Editors, um, and they meet every year, and, and they spend a lot of time talking about ethics. I don't think, as far as I know, they don't have a code of ethics, but newsrooms do, the society of professional journalists do. There must be literally hundreds of codes of ethics in the United States, many of them having to do with the techniques of investigative reporting, 
when can I deceive the source? You know, when can I lie about who I am? Um, you know, when can I use a composite character in my story? When can I Photoshop a photograph? Um, you know, whatever the dilemma might be, there are codes to deal with that level of detail. You can go online and read the New York Times, New York Times standard. It's very elaborate and very thoughtful. I mean, here's a newsroom that's really thought long and hard about these things. Um, it's just that their code involved, in terms of participating in the creation of the code, it involved journalists only. It didn't involve us. And we might have a very different agenda, a very different sense of what the interesting issues are than journalists would. In fact, research suggests that if you ask readers to list the most interesting ethical questions in journalism, they often don't correspond at all to what journalists see as the most interesting issues in, in journalism. And so, you know, one of the problems with codes, as I said, is it isolates and insulates the profession from the larger community by by specifying conduct that we take seriously or misconduct that we take seriously. And the implication is if it's not covered in our code, it's okay. If it's not covered in our code, it's okay to do. And I think you'd end up with a very different code if we sat around and ended up with a code as opposed to the code that a newsroom might end up with. What was the, the other part was? Power. Yeah, I and mean, this is why Habermas argues that credentials can't enter the forum. Um, it's his attempt to eliminate or at least reduce the conditions for coercion, which is to say power in Habermas's view. You know, that no one, and this goes back to the question you were asking about anonymity, and I have mixed feelings about that. On the one hand, you know, there's an absence of accountability with an anonymity if we don't know who's saying it. On the other hand, it's the anonymity that, that distances the person from their credentials. It forces you to pay attention to what's being said as opposed to who's being who's saying it. So in, in Habermas's ideal world, um, we don't know who the reporter is, you know, we don't know who the reader is, we don't know who the mayor is, it's just their arguments that we're focusing on. And that's, you know, this is why it's called utopian, this is why we're struggling to figure out, given this ideal, how can we make this practical and workable, feasible and manageable, you know, all those things that make this a, a viable proposal as opposed to a proposal that's going to make sense only in the context of a seminar. <clears throat> the downside of this uh, Habermasian proposal is, of course, that it reflects or reminds us very, very much indeed of uh, a bureaucratic uh, construction where it doesn't really matter what individual holds office, it's the whole thing. That that's right. Function, right? And, yeah. and that's right. And, and uh, this, this is exactly the area where codes of ethics have nothing to say. Codes of ethics deal with behavior at the level of individual. Codes of ethics seldom, I can't think of a single code that deals with the institution of journalism, the structural aspects of the institution, how the institution is placed in society. I can't think of a code of ethics, for example, in American journalism that has any statements about the political economy of American journalism. And many of us would argue that's where the really interesting ethical questions reside, are, in, are at the level of structure, at the level of economics, um, that, you know, a, a probably the two most interesting ethical questions in journalism today are ethical questions that aren't covered by any codes. One is the concentration of ownership in the American press. You know, a big ethical question in my mind is Rupert Murdoch and, and what we're going to do to rein him in. The second big question, and this is a relatively new question given the, the new digital landscape, what role, if any, can the state play in creating the conditions for more and better journalism? You know, that, in my mind, is the ethical question of the 21st century. All right, Ten years ago, I would have been laughed out of the room just by raising the question. What do you mean a role for the state? The state can't play any role in American journalism. Given the the one we're watching. Exactly. I mean, the only role the state can play is a lazy, fair role, which is to say no role, hands off, let the marketplace do what it do, do what it does best. Um, if it survives in the marketplace, it is, by virtue of its survival, good journalism. So the marketplace equates the public's interest with the public interest. Well, all of a sudden, we're faced with a set of situations where we recognize, finally, we recognize after 150 years that the marketplace may not be able to sustain the amount and quality of journalism we agree we want. Even journalists are beginning to say that. So journalists now are, for the first time, taking seriously questions about a role for the state. Um, and that's just, that's just a remarkable development. I can't think of a single code of ethics that has anything to say about that. In fact, journalists historically have denied that there's any role for the state. It could be or is, despite the fact that there are heavy subsidies for American journalism 
journalists don't use the word subsidies. You know, so that the American press in the United States has long had access to a second-class mailing permit that none of us have access to, which allows magazine publishers and newspaper publishers to mail their periodicals <coughs> out at a fraction of the rate that we would have to pay because long ago we recognized the importance of distribution for the success of American journalism. I can't think of an American journalism operation that describes that as a state subsidy. That's exactly what it is. And we're beginning to recognize that state subsidies of the kind that exist in the Scandinavian countries, for example, in Sweden and Finland and Denmark, are the kinds of things we may need to take seriously if we want a daily newspaper in our community tomorrow as opposed to today. Do you think it's inevitable, the concentration of ownership? Because I remember when families owned newspapers, and I really believe, I wasn't picking up on it yet, but I really believe they weren't really subject to a lot of uh, intimidation, because even their biggest advertiser wasn't that big a part of their business. But as corporations own media, well, they can pick on other corporations, but they're certainly got to think four times before they start picking on, you know, the home office. I mean, it, it was different under family ownership for a number of reasons. And you're right, most major newspapers in the United States were family owned, as the New York Times is family owned and the Washington Post. Um, but little by little, as, as new generations came along that had no ties to local journalism, they were made offers by publicly traded companies that they simply couldn't walk away from. They became millionaires overnight. And since they had no particular investment in journalism, no personal investment, and didn't even live in the local community anymore, and this played out in Louisville, and it played out in Hartford, Connecticut, you know, all over the United States. Family-owned newspapers were sold to publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies have a quarterly obligation to show results. And there's just no two ways around that. If I was investing in, you know, Gannett or some other newspaper chain, I would not want to hear a discussion about journalism. Right? I don't want the board of directors telling me, but they're winning.